now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Gerald Moore in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe from 72 Years Ago Today, May 2nd, 1950, and the episode entitled The Seahorse Jockey. And we thank you for tuning in on this Monday, 2nd day of May, 122nd day of the year, 243 days remaining until we get to 2023. King Charles II of England granted a permanent charter to the Hudson's Bay Company in 1670 to open up the fur trade in North America. Good Housekeeping magazine went on sale for the first time on this date in 1885. General Motors acquired the Chevrolet Motor Company of Delaware in 1918. The first game of the Negro National League played in Indianapolis, Indiana, Black Baseball. Back in 1920. Jack Benny's radio show aired for the first time on this date in 1932. Listen to this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Benny talking and making my first appearance on the air professionally. By that I mean I'm finally getting paid, which of course will be a great relief to my creditors. I, uh, I really don't know why I'm here. I'm supposed to be a sort of a master of ceremonies and tell you all the things that will happen, which would happen anyway. I must introduce the different artists who could easily introduce themselves and also talk about the Canada Dry made to order by the glass, which is a waste of time, as you know all about it. You drink it like it and don't want to hear about it. So, ladies and gentlemen, a master of ceremonies is really a fellow who is unemployed and gets paid for it. Compare that 1932 clip with the, this exchange from, uh, with Fred Allen that came uh, some 15 years later. People don't want entertainment today. A radio show has to give away things. Nylons, ice boxes, automobiles. You mean to stay on the air, you have to give things away? Yeah. I'll die first. <laughs> and while that was a clip from the Fred Allen show, it shows you how much Jack's persona changed from 1932 until, uh, I believe that was 46 or 48 in the uh, Fred Allen show, King for a Day. It was uh, it was uh, fun. Jack Benny going on the air for the first time on his own show in 1932. Uh, the Soviet Union announced the capture of Berlin on this date in 1945. Soviet soldiers hoisted their red flag over the Reichstag building. German forces surrendered in Italy. German forces surrendered to the New Zealand Army in Trieste. In 1946, the Battle of Alcatraz, Alcatraz Federal Prison, San Francisco, taken over by six inmates following a failed escape attempt. The world's first ever jet airliner, the de Havilland Comet, made its maiden voyage in 1952, flying from London to Johannesburg, South Africa. Tennessee Williams won the Pulitzer Prize in 1955 for the drama Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Buddy Baker became the first stock car driver to finish a 500-mile late race in less than three hours on this date in 1972 en route to winning, and here's how things have changed. It was the Winston Select 500 at the Alabama International Motor Speedway in Talladega, Alabama. Uh, President Reagan met with Pope John Paul in Alaska on this date in 1984. I want to welcome your holiness to the United States and on behalf of the American people say how pleased and privileged we are to have you among us. God bless America. The president returning to the U.S. from a visit to China, Pope John Paul II making a stopover on his way to South Korea, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, and Thailand. The Pontiac Grand Am ceased production on this date in 2005 at the 100-year-old Lansing M plant. And a pastel version of the Scream by Norwegian painter Edvard Munch sold for $120 million at a New York City auction. It set a new world record for a work of art at auction. Among those passing away on this date in history, inventor Peter Leonardo da Vinci, Senator Joseph McCarthy, 
Hart was in the right place, but I think he went way too far in some of his doings, hurt some good people that weren't communists in his pursuit for those who were. Uh, also, J. Edgar Hoover passing away on this date. Jack Berry, you remember him? He was he was one of the people responsible for the big game show scandals back in the 50s, but you probably remember him more for some of the game shows he produced in, in the uh, uh, 70s, including Break the Bank. Uh, what was it? The Joker's Wild, the big slot machine show. Yeah. Uh, Jack Berry passing away on this date. Uh, columnist and economist Louis Rukeyser, uh, the ninth Secretary of Housing and Urban Development and football player Jack Kemp, actress Lynn Redgrave, and it's ironic that J. Edgar Hoover would die on the same date as Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. See if you're old enough to remember that he he played a uh, lawman on uh, the television show The FBI. Uh, Hedda Hopper, the gossip colonist, born on this date in history. Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, passing away on this date. Lyricist Lorenz Hart, uh, born on this date, as was pediatrician, baby doctor, as uh, Johnny Carson used to call, refer to him. Well, it is baby doctor. Now, baby doctor Benjamin Spock, also vaudeville performer Pinky Lee. Uh, from The Sound of Music and Fiddler on the Roof, Theodore Beichel, born on this date. Actor Roscoe Lee Brown, Lorenzo Music, actor, and uh, also Leslie Gore, who it's still her party and she'll cry if she wants to. Uh, happy birthday number 86 to Engelbert Humperdinck, the singer, not the, yeah, not that one. 86 years old is Engelbert Humperdinck. Larry Gatlin and the Gatlin brothers still enjoying all the gold in California. Uh, Larry Gatlin, 74 today. You still are smelling what the rock is cooking. Dwayne Johnson, 50 years old today. My gosh, he doesn't look it. Uh, footballer David Beckham is 47. From the office, Ellie Kemper is 42. Racing's Kyle Bush is 37. Also, singer Lily Allen is 37. And former football player, WWE commentator and wrestler Pat McAfee, 35 today. Those some of the people who celebrate the second day of May is their birthday. If this is your birthday... Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say... Happy birthday to you! From 72 years ago, May 2nd, 1950, Gerald Moore and the Adventures of Philip Marlowe on this Monday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. Hi, this is Kyle Horvath with the White Pine County Tourism and Recreation Board. If you want to get away from the big cities and get back to nature this summer, give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. There's so much to do and see, I can't mention it in 30 seconds. But check out our website and you'll see what Nevada is really all about. elynevada.net or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, Gerald Moore, starring in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. This episode from May 2nd, 1950 is entitled The Seahorse Jockey. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This time it was a fishy horseplay from a red-headed beauty, past a black-bearded sailor to a neck-and-neck -neck finish over a wandering seahorse worth 50,000 bucks. And I was the jockey. It happened like this. 
From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Seahorse Jockey. Uh, you know, Mr. Marlowe, when you came in today, I said to myself, I said, it's a funny thing. You've been getting your hair cuts here now for six, seven years. But, but I never found out how you vote, Republican or Democrat. Well, I like to think that's my business. And, and, and another, another thing, uh, never did you tell me if you're for the Marshall Plan or against the Marshall Plan. Well, the Marshall Plan... And, and, and for the California's governor next fall... Well, there's no doubt in my yeah. mind. And, and the income tax... Uh, uh, sit back, please. There. Yeah. Oh. Now, now, the income tax is fair or it's not fair? Well, eminently... Now, now, how, how, come, how come all this stuff, I don't know, what is your opinion? I can't imagine. Uh, of course, my opinion, I tell people. I say political party is a matter of getting to... Oh, excuse me. Saved by the bell. Hello? Uh, Alvin's Barbershop? Uh, Alvin speaking? Who? Mr. Marlowe? Yes, he's right here. Oh, hold on, please. It's for you, Mr. Marlowe. Always interruption, <laughs> ain't it? It's so right. For 60, well, never mind. Thank you. Hello? Mr. Marlowe, this is Mrs. Lola Demra speaking. Oh? Thank goodness I finally located you. Now, you're to come out to my place at once. Pacific Palisades, 1312 Old Tower Road, and your plane leaves in two hours. Now, wait a minute. What plane, there, Mrs. Demarest? Why? What's this all about? The seahorse. I'm going to sell it, Mr. Marlowe. My mind's made up. The sea witch? A sea horse, Mr. Marlowe. It's a brooch six inches high and set with precious stones, which a San Francisco dealer is anxious to pay $5,000 for. Well, look, Mrs. Demarest, I... The dealer's I... flying to New York tomorrow, Mr. Marlowe, and also my doctors say I'm living by sheer willpower alone. Hence, I can my hear decisions it. must be made quickly. Now, the terms of the deal are cash, so please be sure that you're armed. And the money will be returned here to my stepdaughter, Jillian Demarest, unfortunately. Oh, you don't approve, huh? No, no. However, I'll abide by my late husband's wishes. Jillian is to be provided for. Now, no more questions, sir. Just hurry. You'll be paid handsomely. And when you get here, Mr. Marlowe, use the back porch. I'll be in my bedroom. The other doors are locked. You're alone, Mrs. Demarest? No servants? I'm merely sick, Mr. Marlowe, not dead. And no. since I've just fired Elmer Paris, who was called a lawyer, but it was actually more of a baboon, we'll be able to talk now. Hurry, Mr. Marlowe. Please be punctual. My new lawyer is due here at 4.30. I'll finish up and be ready for you at exactly 5. Is that clear? I've got one question. Were you ever a barber? Goodbye, sir. Well, Alvin, it looks like we'll have to skip that shave. Oh, uh, that's, that's too bad, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, like I said, I'm anxious to get your opinions. Opinions are important, huh? Important, oh, you know. Oh, sure, Al, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, the way I look at it, Mr. Marlowe... Alvin! <clears throat> uh, yes, Mr. Marlowe? Wipe the lather off. Your chin, not mine. Pacific Palisades, my new client's home at 1312 Old Town Road, was 40 minutes from L.A. The house was Victorian-style, solid, made of wood, two stories high, and squatted close to the edge of a sun-baked cliff, 200 feet above the ocean. I parked behind what must have been the first Pierce Arrow ever made and started slowly along a gravel path that led to the rear until I heard it. Inside, I found an old woman whom I figured to be my client leaning against the half-open kitchen door, sobbing and clenching at the gingham apron she wore like it would keep her from screaming again. Mrs. Demarest, get hold of yourself. What happened? I'm not Mrs. Demarest. Oh, the poor darling. Her heart. She's dead. She's dead. In there. The bedroom. Oh. But who are you? My name's Philip Marlowe. Mrs. Demarest hired me an hour ago. An hour ago. She was a handsome woman. A beautiful woman and a good woman. You, you're the detective, aren't you, about the brooch? Yeah. How'd this happen, Mrs. Uh, Lockfield? No. Miss Bertie Lockfield. Miss Lockfield, were you with her? No, I came over a bit ago. I'm Lola's best friend, you know, her only friend. I came over in my car to cook her some dinner, like I do all the time. I live right by the little cottage at the foot of Old Tower Road, the one with the tall the hedges. The dinner, Miss Lockfield, you were saying? Oh, yes. Well, uh, Mr. Marlowe, can we go back to the living oh, room? Oh, sure, sure. Now, uh, Miss Lockfield, you came over to cook dinner, then what? 
Well, I looked in on her first, like I do all the time. And since she was asleep, I went to the kitchen and set things going. And then? Oh, here, you better sit down, huh? Thank you. Then I went back to my place, fussed around for ten, maybe twenty minutes. Then I came here again and found what we just saw. That pillow clenched in one hand like she'd wanted all to right, hold All right, all right, take something. it easy, Miss Lockfield. Try to hold on, huh? <laughs> now, tell me. You didn't happen to see anything of the new lawyer around, did you? New lawyer? Why, why Lola didn't mention a new lawyer. He was due here today? Yeah, a half hour ago. Might help if we knew his name. Why, Mr. Marlowe? Mr. Marlowe? Surely you don't think there was, well, foul play? I don't know, Miss Lockfield. But for one thing, the position of the pillow seems kind of cockeyed to me. Yes, but who on earth would want to... Oh, no, not Jillian. It couldn't be. Mrs. Demarest was quite clear about Jillian. Jillian oh, hated Lola, Mr. Marlowe, but Jillian isn't a, a killer. Yeah, well, maybe nobody's been killed. But tell me, Miss Lockfield, did the stepdaughter, this uh, Jillian, know that she was getting the money from the brooch? Oh, no, I doubt it very much. Although she did know that Lola had it, of course, and... And what? And that Lola's money was dwindling, Mr. Marlowe, and that she was selling her possessions one by one. Uh-huh. And therefore, Jillian might think that the seahorse brooch was hers by right of inheritance, huh? Yes. Yeah. Tell me, Miss Lockfield, do you know where Mrs. Demarest kept the brooch? Oh, yes. In the bedroom. I'll show you exactly where. Come. All right. It's behind the portrait of Mr. Demarest and... Uh, Oh, the poor, oh, poor come on. darling. Take it easy, honey, huh? Did you say behind a portrait, that one? Yes. There's a panel in the wall that slides. Uh -huh. Move the picture to your right, Mr. Marlowe. Then pull out on the panel edging. You'd better use the chair. Yeah. <clears throat> to the right. And out on the panel edging, huh? That's it. That's it. See? This velvet case? No, no, those are earrings. The brooch is much bigger. It's in a silk bag, Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Marlowe, don't you see it? No, and I don't think I will. Miss Lockfield, the velvet case is all there is. The seahorse is gone. I called the law and reported both the theft of the brooch and the death of Mrs. Demarest while Bertie Lockfield prompted over my shoulder. After that, I started through the place looking for anything that could possibly give me a lead on the wandering seahorse. Fifteen minutes later, all I could show for my effort was a telephone number, Surfside 10229. It meant nothing to me except that it was written on a sheet of brown roll-your-own cigarette paper. When I dialed the number and got no answer, I dropped the paper into my pocket. I told Miss Lockfield to wait for the police and headed for town in the first public phone booth. I started through the local classified directory looking for a lawyer named Elmer Paris. When I didn't find him, I figured he could be somebody's junior partner. So I began at the top. I scored on my seventh nickel. Calder, Kramer, and McDuff. It was the anchor man who answered. Elmer Paris? Yes, we employ a lawyer by that name. One who was fired by Mrs. Lola Demarest early today, Mr. One McDuff. who ceased working for Mrs. Lola Demarest early today. All right, objection sustained. Tell me, where can I get in touch with Mr. Paris? At his desk here in the office, where he's been all day. Your reason for asking, sir? The answer you just gave me. Now, one last item, Mr. McDuff. Did your firm supply a new lawyer for Mrs. Demarest late today? We did not. And, sir, we never will. Oh? Each lawyer in this office is first a gentleman, second a competent barrister. The belligerent Mrs. Demarest has use for neither. Good day, sir. <laughs> with that, I checked Elmer Paris off my list and went back to the phone book. Jillian Demarest, my late client's stepdaughter, was listed at number 111, Los Amigos Terrace, which a map on the back of the book showed to be just off Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Come in. The girl herself, replete with old fashioned, the only thing that was, was redheaded, maybe 30, and meat and potato curves in either direction, from a waistline that was strictly rye crisp over lettuce leaves. Sit down. What's your problem? Well, I uh, got some bad news, Miss Demarest. Don't tell me. It's my income tax. I've been caught lying. It's your stepmother. She's dead, Jill. Oh. That's too bad. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, well, try not to go to pieces, kid, huh? Look, I didn't particularly like Lola Demarest. She didn't particularly like me. So, why make a thing of it? Because the seahorse brooch has been stolen. You're kidding. Don't try brushing that off, because it was supposed to be sold today with the proceeds to go to you. Proceeds to... You're a liar. Uh Uh-uh, private detective. Hired Jill to fly the brooch to a San Francisco dealer, and I found out it's really worth $50,000. A lot of dough you didn't expect. Okay, Mr. Private Detective. That last crack. It means exactly what? That you could have taken the brooch yourself. Try me again. Surfside, 10229. Stop pushing and start listening. If Lola intended to sell the brooch and give me the money, it was for one reason only. My father wanted it that way. So? So, so do I. And now that you're without a client, maybe you'll work for me. I doubt it. I write and get paid well. 5,000 words a month for a pulp magazine. Torrid stories. It figures. Pays off nicely. Be worth your while. You want to help me? Suppose you're lying and actually stole the brooch yourself. What then? (laughs) Then you handcuff me to the nearest cop and run for mayor on the Let's Clean Up Local Crime ticket. Now, is it a deal? For, say, um, 1% of the 50000 if I get it. Zero if I don't. 500 of fun, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, Jill, it's a deal. Good. Mm, and for a starter, do you happen to know who Mrs. Demarest's new lawyer was? New lawyer? I didn't know the old one had been fired. I didn't say he had. Could have quit, you know. Nobody ever quit working for Lola Demarest. It wasn't her nature. No? Oh. No. Will you please stop barking at me and go out and bite the guy with the brooch? You uh, look like you could do a good job of it for 500 bucks. Yeah. But just think of the opposition, Jill. It's snapping at 50 grand. 72 years ago, May 2nd, 1950, Gerald Moore in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox when we return the news from 72 years ago. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us? We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. You're in tune with Classic Radio Theater on your favorite radio station on this Monday, an episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Gerald Moore, as it was originally broadcast Tuesday, May 2nd, 1950. In the newspapers of that Tuesday 72 years ago, these were some of the headlines. General Omar N. Bradley asked Congress to keep the draft law alive because as far as he can see, quoting now, There has been no let-up in the aggressive extension of communism toward its goal of world domination. 
The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was the first witness as the House Armed Services Committee reopened hearings on proposals to extend the draft. It's due to expire April, uh, June 24th, rather. Speaking of recent events such as the Baltic plane incident, Bradley said the situation, quoting again, frankly gives us little cause for comfort and little excuse for delay. Certainly it does not support discontinuing the Selective Service Act. The president of Standard Oil Company of New Jersey told fellow business leaders today that to win a stable peace, this country must import greater volumes of foreign goods. In an address for the United States Chamber of Commerce, oil man Eugene Holman predicted that widening the gates for imports will help rather than injure the prosperity of this country. Quoting in a paper for the chamber's 38th meeting, I do not think we should hurt our own economy by a flood of foreign goods, nor should we expect any one American industry to bear the brunt of any needed adjustment. But it seems clear that increased imports, within reason, are very necessary. How many beds does a Russian family need to stay happy? That's the question keeping folks awake in the pretty little Long Island residential center of Glen Cove, New York. It's even got the State Department whistling the sleepy time blues. The whole affair could turn into a diplomatic nightmare and set the United Nations tossing and turning. The question hinges on Glen Cove's strict residential zoning laws. Town began to open its eyes the other day when the Soviet UN diplomat Leonid A. Morozov rented the old 47-room J.P. Morgan mansion for the summer at $3,650 for the season. Glen Clove's slumbering suspicions were definitely aroused when it watched van after van of furniture arrive. One Glen Clove scout, lawyer John Finn Jr., managed to mingle with the movers, did a little arithmetic, counted 71 folding beds, 67 canvas chairs, and eight big cafeteria tables. That's one and a third beds for each of the 47 rooms. Even J.P. Morgan himself, capitalist that he was, never bedded people down to that scale. And Bloomington, Indiana, iron bars won't let 58-year-old Claude Strange vote today. But he made sure Monroe County voters knew his name remained on the ballot for the Republican nomination for sheriff. His recorded broadcast of voters Monday night failed to mention he was serving 30 days in the jail. He wants to supervise the charge, public intoxication. Strange made a radio transcription in his jail cell to wind up his campaign before today's primary. His broadcast said, I want everyone to know I'm still on the ballot, so I hope everyone will turn out. And though some of the day's top news stories is reported in the newspapers of Tuesday, May 2nd, 1950, on your radio, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, which continues now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. I drove back to the foot of Old Tower Road in the smothered Ivy Cottage labeled Miss Bertie Lockfield. I started for the front door, but only got halfway. That'll do nicely. Right where you are. Oh, fine. You're a friend of Bertie Lockfield's or a relative, which... A nephew, why? Because, nephew, Aunt Bertie's not home and I want someone responsible to leave a message with. So you go looking for him with a gun, huh? Now listen, baby, I... Shut up and try to remember this. Tell your aunt that the new lawyer Mrs. Demarest hired will be in touch with her. Does that make any sense to you? No. But maybe if I knew his name, it would. (laughs) I doubt it. And now, nephew, without any fuss, let me have your car. Hey, now, wait a minute. Come on. You'll find your car a block away from here where I left mine. Give? No. Happy motoring. Thank you, nephew. And don't forget the message. She backed away, got into my car, and started it without once taking her dead, fish-cold gray eyes off me. When she jerked away from the curb, it was too late for me to do anything but swear and start walking to my car was where she said it would be, so I got in and sulked as far as the first public telephone. It was time to try Surfside 10229 again. Hello? Hello, I'd like to... uh, I'd like to talk to... To who? Wait a minute, is that you, Lieutenant Matthews? Yeah. Marlowe? Yeah, that's right. Oh, that Demarest case, huh? Well, Phil, the coroner thinks it was murder, all right. Suffocated her with a pillow, but they won't be sure till the autopsy report is in. 
Hey, wait a minute, Matthews. Hey, wait a minute. Will you? You're at Surfside 10229, right? Yeah. You got this number from Homicide, didn't you? No, I didn't. I got it from a brown cigarette paper I found at Mrs. Demarest's. Huh? Now, look, tell me, Matthews, what have you got and where are you? 51 South Monroe Place. 51 South. It's a dead one, Phil. A guy who sported a beard. The name was Paul Crater. Oh, uh, occupation lawyer, right? No, Phil, wrong. The occupation was able-bodied seaman. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... May 2nd, 1950, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe on this Monday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get Pain Magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. On Tuesday's Classic Radio Theater, David Bryan stars as Mr. District Attorney from 69 years ago, May 3, 1953, The Case of Murder by Amateurs. A teenage redhead and a pin boy frame the owner of a bowling alley for robbery and murder. You see where the satire is there? Pin boy? It's the guy who sets up the pins in a bowling alley. You may not remember that. This was before automatic pin setters. But the pin boy framing the... Never mind. That'll be on Tuesday's Classic Radio Theater. Right now, the conclusion of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, Gerald Moore, May 2nd, 1950. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe, and tonight's story, The Seahorse Jockey. I was 30 minutes getting out to the address Matthews had given me. The neighborhood around Surfside looked like it had been pushed together from scraps that had washed in from the sea. And number 51 Monroe Place was no improvement. It was a corroded little frame house surrounded by a picket fence with most of its front teeth missing. I parked in the red glare from the squad car's spotlight, and as I walked past the sagging gate, I could hear Matthews inside. Oh, hello, Marlowe. Come on in. But don't fall over the late Mr. Paul Crater there. Oh, that's him, huh? Doesn't look much like a sailor to me, Matthews, in spite of his whiskers. What do you expect, Bill Bottom trousers? All right, all right. Those guys wear suits when they're short like anyone else. He was shot twice, Phil. Once in the stomach, once in the chest. Drop right here in front of the door, huh? Yeah. The way it looked, somebody came up and knocked, and when Crater opened the door, they let him have it. Got a line on him? Well, he was a nice, quiet guy, apparently. Uh Lived here with his sister, Helen, and as far as we know, they got along fine. We're still trying to locate her. He worked around here someplace, but we don't know where yet. But what about that Emerus business? Oh, that. Well, I... Oh, wait a minute. Oh, okay. Matthews. Yeah, Mooney. I see. Jug Nola. As in J-U-G? Yeah. Uh-huh. He is? All right, fine. No, uh, you come on back. I'll check them later, personally. Well, Phil, that answers one question anyway. Crater here worked out of a boatyard on Front Street. What was that Nolan, J-U-G, about? Jug Nolan. He's the bird who runs the shipyard. Oh. Mooney says he's a genuine old sea dog from Roll Your Owns to... Wait a minute. Did you say Roll Your Owns? Yeah. Matthews, how about letting me talk to this Nolan before you and the boys move in? Why? I'd like to check the color of his cigarette papers, and I'll let you know. Well, okay, Milo. Only keep your chin in. Maybe Nolan doesn't know anything about what happened to Crater here. Unless he pulled the trigger, huh? I drove through the thick smell of seaweed and dead fish that was front straight for ten blocks. Before I found a battered sign that read Nolan's, dangled over the door to a shanty of an office behind which a tangle of crooked masts stuck up like jack straws out of a jam of crusty hoax. I pulled into the curb across the street from the place and started to get out when the office door opened. And a man who looked something left over from Moby Dick stepped out, headed across in my direction. 
As he passed in front of my car, I got a good look at the butt of the homemade cigarette. Drooping over a jaw as heavy as the end of an anchor. It was rolled with brown paper. Odds on, it had to be Jug Nolan. When he swung on down the street and finally went into a bar, I followed. Hey, sweet. Do it again, huh? Be right with you, Chuck. Well, snap to it. I gotta get... Well, what do you make of it, mate? Something biting you? Not exactly, Chuck. I was just wondering how well you're acquainted with Lola Demarest. Demarest? Yeah. Well enough to know she's got vinegar in her veins instead of blood. Why? Is the old crackpot something to you? No, not now. She was my client early at night. I'm a private detective. Name's Marlowe. Now, keep it. You were up to see her today. I'd like to know why. Go ask her. That's a little tough now. She's dead. Yeah? Well, better late than never, mate. Miss her, do you? I can stand the strain. What was your business with her? Boats. Sure it wasn't seahorses? Don't talk bills to me, mate. I said boats. Two rusty rotten scows covered with barnacles enough to sink them in another week. But to hear that old gal talk, you think each one was the Queen Mary. Hey, Swede! Yeah? Pour me that drink. Okay, okay, Chuck. Here. Here you are. What's yours, mister? Scotch. Johnny Walker. Take them both out of this. No, you don't. I'll buy my own. But I'm tired of your questions, mate, so haul out. Here, sweet. Okay. Suit yourself. Maybe you can bear up on one more question, Nolan. For you, maybe it's easy. Who killed Paul Crater? What was that? Somebody put two bullets in Paul Crater in front door of his house. I just came from there. Oh, dead. Well, if you're lying to me, mate, I'll tear you in two. Get your hands off, Jug. Why would I lie? Do the cops know who did it? Not yet, but they will. I'll find out about this and in a hurry. Slow down, Nolan. There's no rush. Fred is going to be dead a long time. I want to ask Get you Get out something. of my way. Now look, Nolan, I said I wanted to... Never mind. Okay, Commodore, help yourself. Nolan's ponderous right fist was cocked when I changed my mind, but that wasn't what did it. Over his shoulder, I'd spotted a familiar face. Detective Lieutenant Matthews leaning at the end of the bar and studying his thumbnail intently. As Jug stamped past him and out the door, Matthews jerked the intriguing thumb at a thin, sandy man working a pinball machine who suddenly lost all interest in the game and left abruptly. And Matthews sidled down the bar toward me. Sorry to step on your heels there, Bill, but we found out that Nolan has two judgments against him for assault. Got a very dangerous temper, it seems. Well, you saved me a split lip. Did you hear all of it? Enough to convince me that Chuck Nolan didn't do it, but we'll tag him just to play safe. Oh. Chances are he's heading for Crater's house now, which should just give me a good chance to go to his place and look around. Uh -huh. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, so long, Matthew. Something else for you, mister? No, thanks, Swede. Unless you can tell me why so many surfside sailors grow Van Dykes. <laughs> I wondered myself. Maybe it's to hide those dirty collars. I don't know. Hey, <laughs> Swede, couldn't stand the city gang. Hey, here's one with a beaver now, mister. Why don't you ask him? Oh, it's not that important. Come on, let's go, Swede. Set me up some rye oh, whiskey. Okay, all right. Say, Dusik, this fella here wants to know why you sailors go those chin whiskers. Ah, <laughs> yeah? Hey, Skipper, I'll tell you. The sailor's got to have something to do while he's away with spare time at sea that uh, don't take up too much space. Yeah, well, I guess it beats bike racing. I'll see you, Dusik. Uh, <laughs> hey, wait, I want what? to tell you. I went to town today looking for nothing but a change of scene in a chubby blonde shirt, with see? And what happens? Yeah, well, that's fine. Some girl I... takes a look at my bed and thinks I'm a college professor doing research. I couldn't throw her out with a blowtorch. Yes, the well, I... The next one runs for her life because she takes me for a judge. And after a that, judge. I'm just getting around... Hey, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it, Dusik. Huh? You say judge? What's up, Skipper? Are you losing your rudder? Just the opposite. You've given me an idea that'll work. Yeah, and what? Two murders, a beautiful sneer, and a missing seahorse. Ah. It's wild, but it's beginning to make some sense. So long, sailor. <laughs> I checked Nolan's boatyard first, but his opera shack was dark. So I drove hard back to 51 Monroe Place in the hope that Matthews had been right about Jug's destination. When I ground to a stop, I once again gave thanks for smart cops. Jug Nolan was there, all the fight gone out of him as he stared without seeing it at the blood spot on the floor where Paul Crater had died. I asked him one simple question. The answer he grunted in three words without so much as looking up. But it made everything fit. And as I got to the phone, I knew that whatever else he was, the old sea dog was no liar. Hello? It's Marlowe, Jill. Oh, I've been waiting for this. What is it? Money or fun? All depends. Now listen close. I've got to have some help right away. What's wrong? Where are you, Phil? It doesn't matter, but this does. Get hold of that friend of your stepmother's. What's her name? Uh, Bertie Lockfield. And both of you meet me at your stepmother's house as soon as you can make it. It's important, baby. Don't fail me. So long. Well, yes, I understand you wanted our help in a big hurry. We rushed madly over I'm here. I'm sorry it took longer to get here than I figured. What do you want us to do, Phil? Catch a thief and a killer. You see, I'm positive now that whoever got away with that jeweled seahorse also held that pillar over Mrs. Demarest's face until she died. Then went on to kill Paul Crater in Surfside. 
Two murders? Killers have that advantage, baby. For one murder or a dozen, the price is the same. Well, I don't understand, Marlowe. Does the second murder have something to do with my stepmother's death? They follow like links in a chain, Jill. Lola Damaris called me at 4. She was expecting a new lorry at 4.30. When I got here at 5, she was dead and the jewel seahorse was gone. However, the circumstances indicated that somebody who knew her had done the work. Then you don't think the new lawyer was the no, one No, who... but I do think the new lawyer came in, just as I did later through the open back door. Stood right over there and overheard the entire business. Can you prove all this, Marlowe? Not yet. But if you found that new lawyer, you could. Right. That new lawyer's going to turn up soon, and when she does, we'll have something she? more. Yeah, she, she, Bertie. Lola Demarest's new lawyer is a woman. A woman? The distinguished man in suit in Van Dyke that you shot and killed in Surfside was the lady lawyer's brother, a seaman. You mean Bertie? Yes, yeah, you. The new lawyer who witnessed the whole thing decided to move in on it, right, Bertie? But it was blackmail. I got a note in my mailbox from a lawyer named Crater accusing me and demanding money. And since you were already in so deep, you figured another murder wouldn't matter. You got the lawyer's surfside address some way and went there. And that's why you stumbled, Bertie, over a suit of clothes and a beard. Bertie, well, you were Lola's best friend. You'll never understand, you fool. So don't try. Bertie! Don't you try either, Marlo. Make a move for your gun and I'll put a bullet in her back. <laughs> Lola Demarest's best friend. <laughs> I despised and hated her. The years I worked and slaved for that woman, pampering her, putting up with her sickness, and her temper and her high-handed ways. She owed me plenty for those years. When it came time to pay, the money went to you, you cheap little snip. You done nothing for her. You were getting everything. Stand still, Marlowe. I came prepared, remember? So did I, Mrs. Zockfield. Helen Crater. Better drop it, Bertie. You're in the middle. Listen, we can still do business like you said in the note. Not now, sister. You forget three things. First, you tried to kill me. Second, you did kill my brother. Helen, you don't know what you're doing. And third, the female of the species is always deadlier than the male. Well, Matthews, that's about it. Yeah. What do you think will happen to Helen Crater? No, that's one I don't have to figure out. Uh, well, she's a lawyer, you know. Maybe by the she way, Phil, uh, how did you find out she was the lawyer? Oh, that. Well, you see, the fact that the new lawyer was nowhere around bothered me. Uh-huh. And when I was in that bar in Surfside, one sailor with a beard told me he'd been mistaken for a judge. <laughs> so I figured maybe another sailor also with a beard could have been mistaken for a lawyer. You and uh, you worked back from that? Yeah. For Paul Crater's sister, Helen. I finally asked Nolan what Helen Crater did for a living. He told me. You see, he was the guy who had recommended Helen in the first place. He'd come to see Lola about the boats uh-huh. and found out that she needed a lawyer, right? That's right. So he tossed some business to Paul Crater's sister. That's how the phone number came on brown cigarette paper, though. You know, I found it on the sun porch. Well, that's it. Yeah. Well, you gonna get some coffee? No, no, thanks, Matthews. Okay, tired. Oh, I think I'll go home. <laughs> Almost three in the morning. A silent, sterile hour at the short end of a long, long night. Everything that happened had been because of a jeweled seahorse, an ugly little replica of an ugly little fish. But then, as I thought about it, I realized that the trouble wasn't because of the seahorse. It was because of the people. Bertie Lockfield, Helen Crater, Lola Demarest. <laughs> That's always the trouble. People. Yeah coin a cliche. It takes all kinds of people to louse up the world. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and written by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Stan Waxman, Ann Morrison, Ruth Parrott, Eileen Prince, Ed Begley, John Stevenson, and Bob Sweeney. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time all I had to go on was a postmark, but that was plenty. It led me to a knife between a pair of shoulders, a woman with a second-hand face, and a corpse by a water wheel. Shh. <laughs> 
From May 2nd, 1950, 72 years ago today, Philip Marlowe on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Don't forget that if you miss a day on this station, you do not have to miss a single show. Our shows are always available through iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, or Facebook, just by searching Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. That's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You can also get our our Facebook link through our webpage, which is at classicradio.stream. You can also get our Twitter feed there as well, classicradio.stream. You can also learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own, and you can contact me there as well, classicradio.stream. Thanks for tuning in. Thank this radio station. Support their advertising. And by all means, have a great week. Tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.